Let's sing together, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Sing together. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Let's read together 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, and 23. Let's read together. together. Knowing that you were not, knowing that you were redeemed with not redeemed from corruptible silver or gold from your aimless conduct received. Thank you but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Let's sing together. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty son and to become the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Till I am 
just a lamb of God. Amen. And thank the Lord for our time and ask for his blessing. She'll please join me here now. Father, we love you this morning. We are grateful for the truth that we have sung and that the truth that we have read this morning. Lord, thank you for being just a faithful, loving, true, always present with us God. We thank you for bridging the gap between us. Our sins separate us, but you came to us when we could not come to you. Lord, we thank you for what you have done on our behalf. And Lord, this morning as we have assembled ourselves, we do so uh, very grateful that we can assemble and not be uh, scared or fearful of being arrested. Uh, we rejoice in the pastor that has uh, made it home from Turkey from being imprisoned. We thank you for bringing him home. Uh, we thank you that we don't have to face that here. And God, we pray for those brothers and sisters and those in our country that have had uh, such a horrible time with the weather and hurricanes. And we thank you for the relief workers. We thank you for the ability to come alongside and to help. And God, we just pray. We just pray, Lord, that as we live our lives, that those that come behind us would see and find us faithful. Bless us this morning as we sing, as we give, as we listen. I pray, Lord, that we would take your word and apply its truths to our lives. And as a result of that, Lord, that we would exalt our Savior and we would expand your coming kingdom. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to say I'm very thankful. Linda is back from her long, long vacation. It's good to have her back <laughs> with us. And uh, I'm always grateful for those who play our instruments each and every Sunday and appreciate them so much. Never want to take them for granted. Let's dance. We sing together. Whosoever, whosoever, sing together. I am happy. Today and the sun shines bright, the clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior said, Whosoever will may come to Him to stay. Whosoever surely mean to be, surely mean to be, oh, surely mean to be. our memory verse for this month. Many are the plaints of a person's heart. Proverbs 
Proverbs 19.21. Bill, would you lead us, please? If your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn with me to uh, Joshua, chapter number 3. Joshua, chapter 3. I don't know if you uh, have ever felt this way, but you ever feel like your life looks like, like that screen right there? You got troubled waters? Uh, it's just absolutely wearing you out? Or do I live on an island by myself? I think we're all there, don't you think? To come and go, different times of the year, different times of the week. Different times of the month, different things come along, you know, we have problems. We have troubled waters that are before us, and we are to do what? We are to follow the Lord's command as he tells us to stretch out and take those steps. Sometimes it's very troubling. That's what we're going to talk about this morning in Joshua chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as I read just uh, uh, six verses in chapter 3. Uh, you may want to read the rest of the chapter uh, in your time today, but... Uh, uh, but this is a, a good message for me to hear, and I think a good message for you and for us as a church as well. Joshua 3, uh, <coughs> verses 1 through 6. This is what it says. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. 
Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. Let's pray together. Lord, we are very grateful for this day. We are thanking you for the season that you have placed us in as individuals. We thank you for the season that we are in as a church. And Lord, we thank you for the history that we have just read that we can learn from. And Lord, sometimes as we do follow you, it's very difficult, it's very hard. But we know, Lord, that as we follow you, you will see us through. Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, wisdom and knowledge of how to apply your truths and your principles. I pray for myself that you would cleanse me of my sin and that, Lord, today I would be your spokesman and your word would be unhindered through me. Lord, we thank you for all that you're going to do in the weeks, the months, and the years ahead. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a little history uh, this morning as we have read our text. Israel had been uh, miraculously uh, delivered from slavery. Uh, we, we know the exodus. We know how God delivered them. We, we know that story, and that's, on the, that's happened before this. And uh, they've been delivered, but uh, due to their own sinful ways, uh, they, uh, I guess you would see, received 40-year sentence of wandering, in my mind, in circles in the wilderness. And after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that had expired, uh, the children of Israel were poised to take the promised land. It's right there before them. Now, before they can enter the promised land, uh, uh, they, uh, they have some things they must do. They have a, a major obstacle and or something right in the path. And what's in the path is something like this. It's called the Jordan River. And it was at flood stage at harvest time. It was very uh, uh, expanded its banks. And uh, that problem was right there before them. And uh, usually, not at harvest time, the Jordan River would be uh, about 100 uh, or so feet wide. But at harvest time... It was flooded, well beyond its banks. Now, God always, uh, I think, does things uh, in such a way that nobody can ever take credit for what he is doing. Sometimes he'll tell us to do something that is extremely difficult, knowing that we can't do it on our own, so that when he steps in and he shows up and shows off, he is the one who gets all of the glory and all of the credit that is due to his holy name. So oftentimes when God tells you and he tells me and tells us as a church to do something, oftentimes it's very difficult and it's like crossing something like that. How in the world can we do that? How can we get across that water? There, it's, it's, how do we do that? Well, notice in the text there, in verse, uh, in, not the text, but down below that, it was at harvest time, harvest season. Uh, the, that means the Jordan was over its banks and impassable. And some scholars said that that river could have been a mile wide, raging. When you got waters that raise, watch down what happened in, in Florida. When the waters raise and the storms are going, you see the, the destructive nature of what has taken place. And that's kind of, sort of, what they were facing. They had a, a river that was raging right before them, and they were to cross over. And uh, one scholar I read said that it's about 50 times wider than normal. That's a lot. As a vast expanse right before them. And, uh, you know, uh, when you have a flood of that magnitude uh, at harvest time, you talk about swift water. That's, that's how it's going to be swift. Now, there is no way in the world that they could have crossed the Jordan River on their own. There is no way. What they needed was supernatural help. And I suggest to you, that's where we are today. As individuals, as families... And as a church, we have some things ahead of us that we just can't do on our own, but we can have the help of the Almighty, and we can get to our promised land where God has called us to go and to be. Now, this morning, I suggest to you that all of us, we have a Jordan River. 
We have something before us that we are, are called to go through, and we face it as individuals, this Jordan River. We face it as families and as groups and as a family of faith. We all have troubled waters that are before us, and we need God's supernatural help to get to the other side. Now, it may be a physical need. It might just be a financial need. It may be a domestic need, but uh, God often works the same, I think the exact same manner that he has in the past. He gives us a clear command. He gives us a clear directive. And on the surface, in our human strength and in our own ability, it is impassable. There's nothing we can do. It simply can't be done. Now, why does God tell us to do something when we can't? My friends, it's so that when we receive his help, his provision, and his power, the result will be that God will get the glory and the honor due to his holy name. Amen? That's why he brings us to points in our lives to where we, we just can't do this. It's beyond, well beyond us. We, we can't. It's impassable in our own strength. But then when God shows up and shows off, my friends, he is the one that we are praising. He is the one we're lifting up. It's not look what we have done. Look what God has done. You know, as you think about uh, crossing that water, those troubled waters, uh, we can learn a great deal from this as individuals in our text. But also we can learn a great deal as a family of faith. And when you think about crossing waters, there's several things it includes uh, the first thing it includes is, it includes a challenge. You know, you think about it, look at verse 3 and 4. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests who are Levites carry it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark, do not go near it. Now, in this passage that I've read, uh, they were challenged to do several things and uh, as they were entering the promised land. And the first thing you see in the challenge is they were to simply watch for God. Now, how were they to watch for God? Where do I find that in the text? Well, to Israel, the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence in the midst of his people. And the Ark of the Covenant, if you count there, is mentioned seven different times in chapter 3 alone. And there is a great spiritual lesson for us to learn ourselves as the ark represented God's presence each day. Regardless of the rivers or the troubling waters ahead of us that we are facing, we must keep our eyes focused on Him. As you see the ark take out and go ahead of you, watch it. As it moves, you move. When it stops, you stop. We've got to keep our eyes on our master, on the Lord Jesus. When he says, do something, we are to be doing it. When he says, slow down, we are to slow down. That's what we are to do. And they are to watch. You know, it's amazing to me how troubling, maybe, more than amazing, that folks will go days upon days, and they maybe weeks upon weeks, and not have their eyes or their mind focused on him. Him, the Lord Jesus. We do that, uh, uh, we, and you say, well, how, how do we keep our minds and our eyes, our lives focused upon Him? We do that by meeting together. We do that through prayer, through Bible study. And, and my prayer has been, and still is, that as a church, that we would have a revival of faith. A revival of focus. A revival of following. And as we have that revival, we will exalt the Lord Jesus. As we exalt the Lord Jesus, we will expand his kingdom. Now, the first thing they were to do as they were about to enter the promised land, they were to watch God, and by watching the Ark of the Covenant, who represented God. But also notice, if you will, that they were to follow God. The scripture says they were to move as he moved. In other words, when you get to the troubled waters, uh, uh, as you go into the promised land, when God moves, you, you take a step. When God steps, you step. When God stops, you stop. 
And when he picks up the stride at a little faster pace, you move with him. That's a lesson for all of us. For each one of us to, to follow after our Savior. And uh, to, to know, it's, more, it's one thing to, to know uh, what God's doing. But there comes a time in our lives that not only are, do we know what He's doing, we are to do what He is doing. We're to be doing the work He does. And the way I read Scripture, God is always active. He's always moving in this world. He's not some distant God who's not concerned. He's right here. He is concerned. He is doing. He is acting. And what we must do is we must join him in the work. When God moves, we are to move. And uh, uh, let me say to this to you that you know, following Jesus may not be the easiest thing you do. But it'll be the best thing you've ever done. You know what my regret is? My regret is not following him sooner. Don't you have that regret as well? Don't you remember that struggle you had when God was telling you to do something and you were to, to follow me here and, and do this and you were to be involved here and you, you fought and you just wandered around, you kind of waffled and finally you said yes and you look back, wow, why did I wait? Why did I wait? Why did I, why did I drag my feet? My only regret is when I didn't follow Jesus or surrender sooner to him. And uh, if we expect to enter our promised land, we got to learn to watch for God and learn to, to follow after him. But also they were to honor God. That's what they were to do, to honor God. Notice the Israelites are told to stay a thousand yards behind the ark. Now why would that be? Why would they say, stay a thousand yards behind the ark? Well, in order for all the children of Israel to see the ark, which they were to follow... Out in front of them, they needed to back out a distance so they could see. Everybody could see where the ark was, and as it was moving, they were to be moving as well. Uh, they were to keep it at a distance. It says this, then you'll know which way to go. As you can see, since you've never been this way before, but keep a distance about a thousand yards. That's a little more than a half a mile. Easily walk in about ten minutes, allowing everybody in the camp to see the ark of the covenant. Now, we are to honor him by recognizing that he is almighty and he, God, should be out in front of our lives. He. Now, I want to make a statement. Everybody in this room follows somebody or something. And you know what it is for your life. You're following someone or something. And you are able to judge as you look at your own life. Is what I'm following that someone or something worth following? And I suggest to you that the one who is worth following is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who we are to follow. His will, His ways, His purposes... As he moves, we are to move. And as we, he moves and we move, we honor him. We bring glory to him. That's what takes place. So crossing the river, you know, it involved a challenge that they had. You know, as you think about uh, we as a body of believers, a church, we've received a challenge from the Lord. We've received a vision from the Lord, from Almighty God, a, a Bergen Community Center. And you voted, I guess, over a year ago at 88%. This is what God wants us to do. We, we, we made that decision, and uh, they found some, uh, uh, some records of, of a building fund from 1982. That gives us some date, does it not? Now, let's think about that for a moment. Uh, we've watched for God. We have uh, followed Him the best of our ability. We've been praying, and it's our desire to, that, that we honor God, and that we exalt Jesus, and we expand his kingdom. That's what our desire is. We have a challenge, each and every one of us. But also, there's a command in our passage as well, a command as they cross those troubled waters. Next slide, please. There you go. There's a command. Joshua told people in verse 5, he says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, notice there, you will, that word, consecrate yourself. 
Sanctify yourself in some translation. Consecrate yourself. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, that means to, that you declare something sacred. It means you devote irrevocably to the worship of Almighty God. It means that you devote with deep purpose and, and deep dedication. God tells them and he tells us to do something that we, that we are to consecrate ourselves. Now this is what some of us say. We say, well, I'm just waiting on God. It sounds religious, it's very, very spiritual. I'm just waiting upon God. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's an awesome thing to do, and we're admonished in Scripture to wait upon God. But notice in the text, God says that they were to do something. They were to consecrate themselves. There was something they were to do. They were to devote themselves to Almighty God, to conclusively follow Him above everything else, to passionately pursue Him, His cause, His kingdom, above everything else. And here is where we live today. Often we are dedicated to things that really have a really insignificant in light of eternity. Oftentimes. There are folks who pursue accolades and uh, trophies that have little to no eternal significance at all. There are those who are committed to their hobby. There are those who are committed to their sports team. Uh, there are those uh, that are uh, consecrated to all kinds of different things, and there's nothing wrong with that except someone who should be is not first. I came across this quote, and it cut deep to me. You can apply it many different ways. A, friend, a, 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 a parent's job, their first priority is not to produce athletes but to produce disciples. Ouch. Let that sink in just for a moment. Grandparents, come in where your children may be lacking. You're to help, come alongside of. Being a disciple of Jesus is far more weightier and far more eternal and more valuable than anything this world has to offer. Amen? We're to make disciples. I overheard a conversation the other day. A man, obviously, by you could just look and tell, he had spent a lot of time in the gym. You know what I'm talking about. He's just a, a mammoth of a man. And this new person at the gym began to talk to this person who had been there for a long time. And this is what they said. They said, well, tell me, uh, how long did it take, in other words, to get like you? I want to be like you. How long did it take to get that way? And this, I heard this, and I, 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 I got it down when I got home. Uh, the, the guy said this, it's really a lifestyle. He went on to say, it's the way you sleep, the way you eat, the way you work. It takes dedication. You do it even when you don't feel like it. And you've got to do it consistently. Well, there's your sermon right there. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to be passionate about Him, it takes all of those things, my friends. It is a lifestyle. It's the way you sleep, the way you eat, the way you work, the way you play. It's going to take dedication above everything else. Even when you don't feel like it, you've got to do it. Follow Jesus. Came across this quote by Charles Spurgeon. Well, it's not cooperating, is it? There, maybe it'll stop. I love this quote. It says, If it does not glorify Christ, let it not console or please you. Now, just put that on for a moment. If it doesn't glorify Christ, let it not please you. Those are some deep words, aren't they? Listen, this is what God does. He saved us by His marvelous grace. Marvelous grace. But after He saves us because of what He has done and what He has said about us, I, we, want to be consecrated to Him. I want to do my very best for Him. I don't give Him leftovers or seconds or thirds or whatever is left over at the end of the week. I want to give Him first. 
A.W. Tozer made this statement, and I think it's so true. This has been years ago. A whole generation of Christians has come up believing that it's possible to accept Christ without forsaking the world. Often, this is what happens. We get ourselves into a heap of trouble and in bad situations just because we listen to the voice of human reason rather than God's word. Now, here's a question for you. I know you know the answer to it. I ask it rhetorically. What lasts forever? What, what lasts forever? God's word. Human wisdom, it passes away. It, it will be burned up and gone at the end. And God expects us in our text there, he told them, and I think he tells us, to consecrate yourselves. There's something for you to do. And hear me, my friend, what I'm not saying. I am not saying God will not help us. He does and he has and he will, but he expects us to take responsibility and consecrate ourselves. The Lord told them, right in the text there, to consecrate yourselves. That means that, uh, uh, what that, that is, I think, the lack of consecration is what keeps many a person and many a church from being able to cross those troubled waters and to get to the promised land where God has called us. So oftentimes, folks will not devote conclusively to the Almighty God. They will not passionately pursue Him, His cause, or His kingdom with deep dedication, and what, they, what God says in our text there, what he said to, to Israel, and he says to us as well, that we are to consecrate ourselves, and what that means is, well, there are some things that need to be removed from our lives. It doesn't glorify Christ, may it not please me. There are things to be removed from our lives. Some say, well, I'm going to let God remove it. <clears throat> be careful. He says, consecrate yourselves. There's things we ought to remove, yes, but there's also things we should add to our life. And what I'm talking about is personal responsibility. That's something that's not talked about a great deal today. We did touch on it today in our Sunday school class. It was a great refresher to hear this. But you know, let me give you some examples of personal responsibility. For example, some, not throwing rocks at anybody, for some, they wear their clothes, throw them on the floor. Now listen, who in the world... Uh, should pick up those clothes off the floor. Tell me. Who took them off? Amen? You know, I'm guilty of that sometimes. Praise God for Miss Libby. <laughs> you know, but who's responsible? When I take off a sweaty shirt from the gym, who's responsible for putting that dirty clothes? Who? Me. There's personal responsibility. But, but also, you, you think about this, uh, th same way of making your bed. Uh, whoever messed the bed up ought to make it. Amen? All parents go, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, right? Maybe some of you say to your spouses, uh-huh, yeah, 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 that's the way it ought to be. Personal responsibility. Now, the, the point I'm trying to make is this, that many are waiting for God to do something, and he's waiting on you. Consecrate yourselves. Remove some things and add other things. God's way on us to devote conclusively to Him, to enthusiastically pursue Him, to passionately follow His ways, and to dedicate ourselves to His kingdom. And may the Lord help us realize what is hindering us from getting to our promised land. Now when I say promise, I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about the place where God's called you right now. God called them to take the promised land. He's calling us to consecrate ourselves. Oftentimes, the person in the way is the one we see in the mirror. Of where we ought to be. You know, there are, you talk about crossing over troubled waters. Getting to the promised land. There, there are, I'm sure you could, you probably in your mind can think as I can. There are Christians that when they first uh, became a child of God, they were enthusiastic about following the Lord. They were very passionate. And somewhere along the line, in their Christian walk, they drew a line in the sand and said, I'll go no further, I'll do no more. And as a result of that line they have drawn in the sand, 
They refuse to take a step further. They refuse to consecrate themselves, to dedicate themselves. And uh, I'm not going to go any further whatsoever. What has happened is, and we, can, we know it in our mind, we see it all around us, they've just stepped away. And as a result of that, they don't want to be around those of us who do. They likely haven't grown in the Lord that much, and they have, are having little, if no, impact, whatsoever, positive impact for the kingdom of God. I say to you, as a church, <clears throat> consecrate yourselves. Devote yourself passionately. Pursue Him for tomorrow. The Lord's going to do amazing things. There's personal responsibility. There are things for me to do. But also notice in the text there, there was involved a, a commitment as well. Verses 9 through 13, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you'll know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you all these people, the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Persites, Gershites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of, of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priest who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now don't miss this. <clears throat> in this passage, there are things they cannot do as they consecrate themselves. Because there are things only God can do. Don't miss that. They are told to do something, what they could do, consecrate yourselves, but in our text there's something that only God can do. Uh, <clears throat> they could not remove the surrounding evil nations, but God could. He says in verse 10, this is how you'll know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you all those folks in the way. <clears throat> That's what he said. Now God will never expect us to do something we cannot do. <clears throat> when you think about the vision God's given us, a Bergen Community Center, when I think about the scope the magnitude, there is absolutely no humanly way a church this side could pull it off. Impossible. But God can. Amen? God has given us a vision, and let me tell you, God has provided. Can I hear an amen? amen? He told us to do something and talk about troubled waters. No way. You can't cross that river. There's no way. It's too deep. It's too raging. It's just too much. There's no way. God did. Did. See, they could, in our text, they could consecrate themselves, but they could not remove the surrounding nations, but God could. <clears throat> the message to the Israelites reminded them that getting across that troubled waters and entering the promised land really was God's idea. Did they dream it up? No, God did. God gave them a plan. <clears throat> and there were problems that were before them. Now, there's one thing I've learned over the years being a pastor. I wish I'd learned when I was just started. I wish I had, had, had got my arms around this or God had revealed it to me when I was younger. But when it comes to the church, the church... It is, and it was, God's idea to build the church. It was, and it is, God's desire to grow the church and to use the church for his kingdom. That's God's idea. It was, and it is. And it was, and it is, God's idea and plan of how we are to do things. It, it's, in, it's all over the, the sticks. Now, here's something I've learned. <clears throat> As a pastor, <clears throat> there's something that I can do. I can spend sufficient time praying and preparing to stand before you. That's what I can do. But when it comes time to deliver the message that God has given me, God has to anoint it and to drive it into your hearts. He can do that. I can't. See, there's something I must do. I've got to study. I've got to prepare. I must pray. 
and be ready to stand before you. And as I do my part, I consecrate myself, doing that every week. Then he is the one who is responsible to plant it into your hearts and to give the increase. <clears throat> the farmer was said <clears throat> year after year he had the biggest and the best watermelons in the county. Someone asked him, well, how in the world do you do that year after year? And this is what he said. See that big tree about 300 yards across the field? Yeah, I see that tree. I do everything I know to do. I plant, fertilize, water. But then when I do all that I can do, I drive on my tractor that tree and I sit under it and I pray. God give the end. In our text, God commits himself to bring the people across, across their Jordan. They had consecrated themselves and done what they could, and now all they were required to do, Israel, was to trust God what only he could do. See, crossing that Jordan River, there was a challenge, there was a command, <clears throat> there needed to be a commitment, but also there is the crossing. Look in verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, verse 16 says... The water from upstream stopped flowing. Stopped. It piled up in a heap just a few yards up the way. Is that what it says? No, no. A great distance away. At a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan, while the waters flowing to the Sea of Areth, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jordan. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Real quick, some things I see here that there was a problem. And this is a misconception that we have that I think we, I have as we follow God's plan that if we say, all right, God's given us a command, therefore, it must be easy. It must be a, a bed of roses or a cakewalk following Jesus. Well, look at verse 15. Now, the Jordan was at flood stage all during the harvest time. Flood stage, raging water outside of its banks. You've got swift currents, all that. And the Jordan, <clears throat> it was overflowing, it was raging. And uh, one commentator said it was about a mile wide. They couldn't build a bridge, probably didn't have the resources or materials or time because you are to do it. As you see the ark move, you move with it. Didn't have time. They couldn't transport everybody on boats, probably had no boats. There was only one way around their problem, and that was through it. God looks at our problems, and he says, to us, what he says to them, follow me. I'll get you there. Follow me. I'll get you there. But also there was a plan. It says this, that uh, the Jordan was at flood stage all during the harvest. She had as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge. The plan... God said, when the feet of the priest enter the Jordan, I'm going to part the waters. I'm going to lead you through on dry ground. And I thought it was kind of interesting. I was praying this morning about this message. And how did it all begin? The part of the Red Sea. That's where it began, right? Now he's, crossing, he's parting the Jordan. Began with a miracle, ended with a miracle. This is kind of a double miracle. The, the part of the water in the, the dry ground. I don't know about you, but have you ever walked through a pond that you thought had dried up? <laughs> thought had dried up? 
I, I tell you a real quick story. I was probably 20 years old, and I had bought a 73 Blazer for no other purpose than four wheeling with. I had a ball of fun with that. And I was at a friend's farm, and there was a pond. You know where it's going, don't you? And I went through the shallow end where it's dried up, and I threw mud everywhere, had the best time just throwing, just having a ball. And on the other end is where the dam was of the pond. Well, it wasn't that deep. You know, I thought, well, I'll go on the dam. I'll come down this way and go, I'll get shallower as I go. That'd be great. It'd be awesome. <laughs> Sunk to the frame. Tires just spinning in water, touching nothing. You ever think something like that? Yeah, be careful. You know, when you think about uh, <laughs> dry ground, Jordan's raging. It didn't look like it had dried up. It had. I believe the Bible's clear. They walked over on what? Slushy ground? Wet ground? They clotted through the mud? No, no. Dry ground. It's what the Bible says they walked over on. And you think about this. Think about this. Nothing happened until <clears throat> they got their feet wet. Nothing. They could have got right there and stopped before their feet touched the water, said, no, we got to watch God slow that river down before we step into it. No, no, no. It, nothing happened here. They got their feet wet. I just wonder, that's where we are today as a church. Maybe as your family, or maybe you as a Christian, you're, you're right on the edge of where God wants you to go, but you're going to, well, I'm going to let God do something. God said, consecrate yourselves and take that step of faith. That's what it takes. That's what, in our text there, can you imagine holding that Ark of the Covenant and seeing that raging river over a mile wide? It's just raging and sloshing back and forth. And it's flood time, and you've got the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence. He says, take a step. What do you do? Do we balk? Say, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait until it slows down or until it us a, a better season, not harvest time. Had they waited for a better season, not harvest time, they would have been completely disobedient to God. And they would have got some glory themselves. Well, we were smart enough to wait until it was a better season when the river was down and we could handle it all on our own. Ouch. Ouch, ouch. No. They put their feet in the water. They got their feet wet. I would suggest to you that's a step of faith. The miracle didn't happen until they took that step. They'd consecrated themselves, they'd watched, they'd listened, they'd followed, they'd done their part, but it come time to put that first foot in the water, they did it. See, God had a plan, but for his plan to work, Faith on part of his people, and, that, and it took a step of faith. And look what God did. It says the water from upstream stopped flowing. Now, this is something I, I, I saw a while back, but it just still blows my mind. It piled up a heap a great distance away, and it says there at a town called Adam. Upstream. And you get you one of those Bible maps out or a Bible program like I have, and you see here, how far is it from here to here? You know how far that was, what they say, scholars? 15, 20 miles. From where the water stopped upstream to where they crossed. So this is, this is how I, I open this in my own mind. Here we go. God says, take that step. We're on the edge of the Jordan. Take that step. Oh, my goodness. And they take a step, and they have to stop. Water's still raging. So some 15, 20 miles upstream is where the water stopped. They had to stand there in faith while what God had told them to do amidst the storm. And don't you know they felt relieved when they saw that water stop as it came, as it all passed through them? Can you, can you imagine how that felt? Can you imagine how the, the faith they had after that? You know, think what, how we would feel. Uh, God said, put our feet in the water, and we did, and we had to wait. So, now, how fast the river flow when it's flows? I don't know. If it went 50 miles an hour, that's, 50, that's an hour. They stood there waiting for the water to pass on through. Then somehow God just dried it up. That's the God we serve. He's not changed one bit. When they stepped in that raging river, it parted, backed upstream, rest flowed right down by them, and God made a path. 
that was more than adequate for all the people to cross over. I love that song we sing sometimes. Uh, it's old, it kind of dates me a little bit. One of the first praise songs, God will make a way when there seems to be no other way. God will make a way. You know what I'm talking about. He, he's a still same miracle working God that, we've, that we know. He's not changed. And maybe you're facing a, a troubled water as an individual or as a family. Whether it's at work or at home or financial, whatever it may be. Put your trust in God. Watch what He's doing and follow Him. When He says move, move and put your trust in Him. And He'll get you through the troubled waters. He'll get you where He wants you to be. So there was a challenge in this text. There was a, a command and there was a, a commitment on the people and there was the crossing. I was praying this morning. We're not going to get into a great theological debate, but think about this. The question that God asked me was this. What if they hadn't? Now here's a question I ask you, what if you don't? What if you don't? God gives you a clear command. Gives you a challenge. There's such, a, there's such power in choice. Such power. What we can learn from this text, I believe, as individuals, no doubt. We can also learn from this text as a family of faith. God's got great things. He, he's going to do great things, but we're going to have to get our feet wet. We're going to get our feet wet. Now, can you imagine? As you, as a, an individual, get your feet wet through whatever rivers are in front of you, when you stand there in faith, waiting and watching God to do the miraculous, then he does it, he shows up and shows off, and you get to the other side, what kind of praise party you're going to have? Don't miss that party. Get your feet wet. Whatever it may be. And, and I think about it as, as a church, you know, we're right on the edge. Right on the edge. We get our feet wet. And stand there in faith and watch what God's going to do. But there's a choice. There's a choice. And the choice is, in the text, as the priest leave us whole mark, they stepped in the water, they stood there in faith. The water finally, it, it dried up. They walked through on dry ground. They stood there as everybody passed right by them. And everybody in Israel had to choose. Some could have stayed back if they wanted to, I guess. At their own peril, you know. That's my, my, my idea. We have a choice. A choice. And I don't want to miss that praise party, do you? I can't wait. What God's going to do next week, next month, next year, next five years. I can't wait. Well, we've got to stand there in faith and watch God do what only he can do. Do our part, certainly, but stand there in faith and watch God show off. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for our text. Thank you for the history. Lord, I pray that whatever... Jordan, we're on the edge of as individuals. That you would help us to watch, to listen, and to follow. And as you direct us, get our feet wet. Lord, we know that you have great things. You want, you want we as individuals and as a church, as a whole, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ who came from heaven to earth.
to bridge that gap that had separated us from you, our sin. And Lord, I pray you would help us to exalt him as a result of what you have done and what you have said about us. May we consecrate ourselves. May we get our feet wet. God, as we watch and we see what you are doing, God, I pray we would give you every ounce of praise within our lives. Thank you for being so good to us and trusting us with such a such potential and such promise. Lord, I pray that everybody here that we, as you direct us, we get our feet wet. And God, we thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling, take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming today.